Hi, everybody. Hi, everybody, and welcome. Uh, I'm so used to saying Khosh Umadi because I've been streaming Persian, uh, but I'm not streaming Persian anymore. That's, uh, I'm still studying it, but that's not what I'm streaming. Hi, everybody. I'm saying I'm uh, used to saying Khosh Umadi because I've been streaming Persian, but I am not streaming Persian anymore. I uh, am still studying it, but I am going to stream Hebrew today. Uh, Levantine Arabic tomorrow, and I'm probably going to keep that schedule up for the next few weeks to few months and see how everything goes. Uh, I see Ryan in the chat. Shalom. Uh, shalom l'kolam, brachim habayim. Uh, we are going to uh, get uh, down to some really fun stuff today. So I'm going to make sure that I can see the viewer activity, my analytics, all that good stuff. Um, I think all my lights are on. I have my microphone. I think I'm I'm doing all right. So uh, I actually don't know what level of um, uh, participation I'm going to have from like the same people versus different people from previous live streams. So this is going to be really interesting to see. Um, I see from Theta Sigma. Shalom, shalom. Um, by the way, for everybody, uh, just. Uh, First things first, it is a holiday, so for those of you observing, Chag Purim Sameach, and, uh, you know, I hope you're enjoying. I have, um, uh, it's not water, and uh, I don't know if I can talk about it on live streams much, so it's from Czechoslovakia, and if you know, you know, and if you don't know, then, well, I'm old enough that Czechoslovakia is a thing that makes sense to me. It's from the Czech Republic, um, so, <laughs> one second. <laughs> All right. Chag Sameach to everyone. Um, all right, so let's see. Uh, I keep getting these stream warnings, but then everything's fine. Uh, so that's fine. Uh, all right. So uh, what I'm going to do today uh, is start uh, with Hebrew. Now, I have, um, I think I put it uh, in the description, but I'll put it in the chat. I have a link to the textbook, the updated version. Um, I'm going to be using... Sippy Littleton's Colloquial Hebrew from Rutledge, the colloquial series. Uh, it has some uh, errors. It has some, some shortcomings. It leaves some things to be desired, but it is also one of the best things that I've seen out there for Hebrew. Um, and frankly, I just really like the Rutledge colloquial courses. Um, I'm going to be using the first edition on PDF because I have that on PDF, but I did buy the second edition. Uh, the second edition has some updates. It has some, uh, some good things. Uh, I'm going to, let me close out all my Gmails. So I'm not like just destroying the, the, um, the stream rate. And, uh, then let's see, Google just destroys everything. Um, and I'm going to drop a link in the chat for anybody who wants to follow along. I think that's actually the colloquial Arabic link. So let me drop the Rutledge colloquial Hebrew. And uh, there is no need to follow along. There's no need to buy anything. Um, if you actually do buy it, I don't make enough that it makes sense for me to really care. So, I mean, enjoy, but, you know, definitely use my link. I'll take the, you know, however many cents it is. But, um... You know, it, it's not like I'm not here to sell books for Rutledge. Um, if I want to do that, I'll sell my own book uh, once I publish with Rutledge. So let's see. That sounds like I'm advertising a book. Uh, I don't have one. <laughs> All right. So for anybody who is interested in following along, um, that's not how you copy and paste. This should be a link uh, to an Amazon affiliate link. So let me let me hope that that's right. Uh, for some reason, my mouse is going slowly. I think that's just a battery issue, but I can use my trackpad. So welcome, everybody. Um, I see do, 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 uh, a comment about getting uh, tattoos in Hebrew. Always a, a, a fraught uh, subject. Um, but uh, yeah, let's see. I'm going to share my other screen. Um, and we're going to go. We're going to get into this. Now, first of all, Hebrew, like I said, I'm using the, the uh, first edition of the colloquial Hebrew course. 
what the first edition has that the second edition doesn't have that I actually um, really like is uh, the Hebrew English glossary and the English Hebrew glossary. Uh, for some reason, the second edition got rid of this. And uh, I had actually got the second edition in part because I wanted to study on uh, Saturdays and not use electricity. And uh, this is not in it. So I may have to like print it out or something. That's the only difference that I, I think is sort of a shortcoming. The rest is actually great. So let's see. Um, I'm going to go... Let me actually just talk a little bit about Hebrew first. Uh, for those of you who are unfamiliar. So I assume everybody here is familiar with Hebrew as a language. It uh, is in the Semitic family, which is a family of languages that does something unusual that no other family does, uh, which is that it has a templatic morphology. Uh, what that means is um, a lot of words have like three consonants that impart some part of the meaning, and then you fit vowels around, and what vowels you fit around the consonants changes the meaning of the word. So it's not like you know, I have a syllable and then I add another syllable and then I add another syllable and I add things on the beginning and the end or into the middle. It's literally like the syllables are different, but the consonants are the same. So it's a very cool kind of thing. There's a long history there. Um, there's theories as to how that arose that, you know, some are more compelling than others. Uh, but it's, it's definitely very different from other language families. Have in the chat, why are you learning Hebrew? Um, I have a variety of reasons for learning Hebrew, but... Uh, the main one is I just really like it. I actually didn't used to, um, but uh, that's, you know, I thought it was like, I thought modern Hebrew was like Klingon. I thought it was like a conlang that was made by like really overzealous people. And it turns out none of that's true. Hebrew has been, and I'll, I'll this gets me back to the history. Hebrew has been continuously spoken and written for about 3,000 years. Now, it was not the everyday language of the Jews following like, I don't know, about like, by about 200. Um, but uh, it continued and continued on as the lingua franca, the way that everything was written, the way that people, you know, wrote letters to one another, made um, legal decisions, studied, communicated across different communities. Like it has been in continuous use for basically ever, um, <laughs> as far back as we have like writing and stuff. Uh, so it's, it's, it's pretty cool. Um, now, I will be doing... So I gotta gotta take my hoodie off. Um, I taught at uh, Truman State University in the fall. It was fun. So go Bulldogs! Um, but uh, yeah, we'll be doing uh, Levantine Arabic in uh, on Mondays for the most part uh, as well. And we're just gonna we're gonna solve the Middle East, you guys. Let's do it. Um, I've been really actually quite nervous, quite wary of uh, teaching Hebrew. Uh, on here, studying Hebrew on here, talking about Hebrew very much on here, and same about Arabic. And I decided I'm not going to worry anymore. Uh, and I'm going to um, talk about language, talk about culture, and be a voice for communication, cross-cultural communication, understanding, uh, and, and shalom. Um, I see in the chat, it would be interesting to know how Hebrew has changed and evolved, and it is way more than I can get into here. I'll be touching on some of it because the writing system and the way things are written, you know, has historical elements to it, and there's historical changes that kind of impact the present, uh, but it is, it is, uh, it's got a long and interesting history. I should probably just make a full-length YouTube video about it. Um, I see discussion of a neat and aesthetic alphabet. There's some really good Hebrew calligraphy on uh, Instagram, and that world is is very cool. So let me see. I'm going to get my get my stuff together. Um, I'm curious for those of you. I mean, I see some names that look familiar. I see some names that are less familiar from previous live streams. So I'm just curious. Um, drop me a comment in the chat and let me know if you watched any of the Persian live streams or if the Hebrew live streams are your first. Um, just so I know, uh, you know, what I'm working with here. All right, so uh, Hebrew, the complete beginner's guide. Uh, I will not be doing all of this because I feel like that might be some kind of copyright violation. Although I will say this particular textbook, you can't actually, it's hard to buy um, in the first edition. So, uh, and I am giving you a link to buy the second edition. So Rutledge, if you're watching this, I'm, I'm you know, encouraging people to, buy your books. Uh, this is, um, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on reading and writing in, in Persian. Uh, I actually just focus on transliteration in Hebrew. I can't do just transliteration. It would be irresponsible. Um, 
<laughs> but uh, especially with a Templatic morphology, like it would just be extremely irresponsible. Um, but uh, I'm going to kind of balance them. I think that it's really useful to use transliteration in languages that you're studying that use a different script. And the reason for that is that it's one less thing to worry about. It can be a bridge to using their writing system, but it's also, I mean, we all want to like have cool writing systems. I, I, I studied Chinese in university basically at first because the writing system is so cool. And then later, you know, got into Chinese culture. I also said stuff about Chinese, but like, you know, I understand the draw of a cool writing system is what I'm trying to say. Uh, but as far as the science of learning goes, it is much easier to have something that you already know and understand that you see visually, that you memorize. Like it's so much easier for me to memorize words when I have transliteration involved. Now, uh, Hebrew, because of the templatic morphology, because of the root and vowel system, uh, I find that it's actually really helpful to, you know, look at Hebrew as Hebrew because you're going to miss certain patterns if you don't. Um, I see, uh, Omer, Hebrew is your first live stream. Good to see you. Um, I see, <laughs> I'm learning Greek while you learn Hebrew in the background. Um, if this were Hanukkah and not Purim, I, I have something to say about that. Um, all right, I got a few of the first, a few who've seen others. So we're going to have, uh, we're going to have fun. Watch a video about fake polyglots and saw that I advertised the stream. This is going to be fun. All right, so uh, I have studied a little bit of Hebrew. I am not expecting that you all have. Uh, if you are following along, my goal for this is for people who are learning Hebrew to get things that are going to be really useful for them, for me to be able to study and, um, you know, develop as myself, and then for anybody who's doing neither of those, like you're not studying Hebrew on your own, you're just kind of interested in it, to see how a linguist might think about learning a language in a way that's a little bit different, and how I approach these textbooks, because textbooks all have their um, flaws, they all have their challenges. So it's the textbooks, it's um, you know how we go about actually learning, memorizing, retaining this information, and hopefully everybody gets something out of this. But please, please do uh, feel free to leave me uh, questions uh, if you have them. And one thing that I want to say, um, so you should see here reading and writing Hebrew. Yeah, uh, I'm going to kind of skip around in the textbook uh, because I'm not expect I'm not trying to teach you directly the whole textbook. That uh, would be, I think, boring for everybody. So um, if you're unfamiliar with Hebrew, what you do need to know is that there is an aleph bet, which sounds a lot like alphabet. That's for good reason. Um, there are 22 letters and uh, they make historically they had different sounds than they have now. Uh, they all represent consonants, uh, including the, the silent ones. They used to be, they used to be consonants. I see, hello, I'm finally here during the stream. All right, good to see you. <laughs> um, and good discussion of Greek as we go along. So uh, there's handwritten script and there's print. Uh, you should see this on the side here. The new edition does not have the handwritten script here. They have another page later on handwriting, and uh, this has that page as well. What's interesting is the handwriting differs between the two, uh, which I know drives my father-in-law insane. Um, if you're watching uh, Chag um, I just say it's a, a couple of different choices of how you can model your own handwriting if you plan on writing by hand. Now, a um, couple of points that are going to be relevant for modern Hebrew. One is that there's what's called a dagesh, that's a little dot in the middle of the letter. Historically, that meant that the letter was geminate, which is like long. So like if anybody here speaks Italian, um, the, the word for, uh, let's say, let's take eight, right? Otto. That T is long. It's not otto, it's otto. Same thing, Spanish, the difference between pero and perro, right? So you have short and you have long. Three plus thousand years ago, maybe 4,000 years ago, it was a long sound and there was a short version. As languages change, something that is kind of a natural, normal pattern for language change is that what you then get is a short sound and a reduced sound, a lenited sound is the, the technical term is lenition. So what that means is historically you would have had like, you know, I don't know, just I'm putting this in a vowel frame, you would have had like abba and abba. And now what you have is abba and ava, where the, the ba has become what's called spirantized, it's a fricative. Um, so we're gonna see that with a few of these letters. Uh, so you see here, bait and vate. Um, and that's, that is my English pronunciation of these. Uh, so don't, don't at me about that. Uh, same thing down towards the bottom, kaf and chaf. And uh, let's see, there should be another one here. I should make this so I can scroll uh, a little bit easier, but whatever. Um, there's uh, pay and fay. 
right? Uh, the other thing that's worth knowing is that some of these letters had a, a different sound uh, historically. So I'm going to go back to this page, yada, yada, yada. Aleph used to be a glottal stop. So a glottal stop is like, um, like if I say bottle, it's that the, the T sound and bottle, that uh sound. It no longer has that value, right? It, it has all of the things that a glottal stop would do to a language are there. So like it affects the vowels because it's like deep in your throat. So then, you know, maybe a vowel will be different because of a proximity of a glottal stop, but it's no longer a glottal stop. Similarly, um, we have the letter, my mouse is really dying. We have the letter uh, chet, which in modern Hebrew is a velar fricative. That's like where a K and a G is pronounced, but it's just voiceless fricative. So it's like a K, but ch, instead of like actually closing off with the back of your tongue. Historically, that sound would have been like in Arabic. Um, so uh, I'm trying to think of a, like hamar, like a, like a donkey, um, which is, I think, hamar in, in Hebrew. Um, so that has changed, but that historical thing affects some of the vowels around the ch in a way that uh, you don't see with the other ch sound that it's kind of collapsed into. Um, the other thing that I'll say the last one about sound changes is um, some Yemeni speakers retain this, um, but Ain historically was the same as the Arabic Ain um, for Yemenite Hebrew speakers, for Iraqi Hebrew speakers, for for a handful of uh, people who you know who whose ancestors spent the diaspora in Arabic speaking lands. They retained the Ra sound. Uh, for everybody else, it's become a glottal stop or like a nothing. So that's um, uh, Hey, which is like an H sound. H is um, if you don't know, this is something I, I try to hammer home on the channel. H's, given a long enough time frame, become nothing. They disappear. They always disappear. An H is basically another letter on its way to disappearing, like an S on its way to disappearance in like a 500 or 1,000 year time frame. Um, if any of you speak Puerto Rican or Dominican Spanish, you, you understand what I'm talking about. Cuban Spanish too, like, you know, los becomes lo becomes lo. Um, this happens across languages. So, um, let's see, I have some, uh, some good discussion. So, is Biblical Hebrew mutually intelligible to modern Hebrew? Uh, Ariel Nitzav has said to an extent, and I, I will clarify the extent. So, there are things that just sound like, you know, if I were to speak vaguely Shakespearean English, um, this is what I'm told. So, there's certain, like, uh, possessive endings on nouns and so on that if you use them, people will understand you, but it'll be like, you know, what thinkest thou... Uh, you know, me thinks that it is what I, like it just very kind of old fashioned sounding and people will use that to that effect. Um, the flip side of that is that there's been a lot of semantic drift and a lot of people maybe overestimate their understanding of things. So for instance, the word um, kesef means money in modern Hebrew. Um, it is exactly like the word argent in French, meaning it means money, but historically it meant silver, like the material. Um, similarly, a shekel is a, a coin, it's a unit of currency. Um, historically, it was a weight, and it is related to the, you know, shakala sounds to words for weighing things. So I've heard people give, like, a, a dvar Torah when they're explaining, like, it's, um, I guess you would translate that as a sermon, a homily, I don't know. Um, they give a dvar Torah about, you know, passages that relate to um, counting, you know, instead of counting people, you count a half shekel. And I've heard people talk about coins. Coins did not exist at that time. So it's easy to kind of misread modern things into the past. Um, but uh, uh, it's a little, uh, it, for the most part, there's a, a lot of overlap. Um, let's see, what is your level in Hebrew? Just complete beginner? N no. Um, I see uh, from, from uh, Zangoloid, uh, Kesef still means silver in modern Hebrew. Yes, but also money. Um, so my, my level, not complete beginner, but I would say maybe A2. Um, I, I've been studying off and on. I took a long break because um, uh, in October, um, I was in a unit in Duolingo. I'd just been kind of lazily doing Duolingo, and I was in a unit in Duolingo where the reviews were all things like about running to the shelter, and the um, actual content of the course was like, the response must be swift and immediate, I think was one of the sentences, and like, planes are flying in formation. And I was like, I 
cannot handle this. Um, so I took about six months, and uh, now I'm back to studying seriously, but I'm not using Duolingo right now because I cannot handle that. Um, we may see that material here, but we're going to have like sort of fun touristy stuff in this particular uh, uh approach. Um, so that's my, you know, hint of darkness for, for, <laughs> for this, um, which by the way, uh, hugs math, if you're following along. All right. Um, I, I, I have hamantashen, but they're in the other room and I've already eaten way too many. Uh, last thing you need to know is, um, some of the letters have final forms, long forms. Um, and, uh, I see that Duolingo bit is a yikes. It's a major yikes. Um, so uh, the longer form, this is kind of an interesting development in the history of writing. Hebrew writing was invented before the concept of writing down vowels was invented. And it's a templatic morphology, so the vowels kind of seem a little extra anyway. So it wasn't until like 700-ish AD that the Masorotim added uh, dots for vowels to indicate what the vowels are. Uh, one of the things that actually really, really helps in separating words when you just write words when there's no spaces because nobody was using spaces at that time um, spaces periods like those are new inventions that are fantastic but like you go find like go read a greek document from back in the day there's no spaces there's not even a uniform direction of writing the thing um, same thing for anything in cune cuneiform any of that stuff so what hebrew has which is cool is that some of the letters you see um chaf uh, mem, nun, fe, tzadi, uh, they have final forms, which basically tells you, hey, this is the end of a word, which is a really, really helpful thing when you're not spacing words out. So uh, that's fun. Um, are the final forms related to the way Arabic changes form depending on position? Yes. Uh, yes. Uh, same concept. Um, all right. Uh, this talks a little bit about Dagesh. Um, I think... I don't know if I used the word spirantization before. In biblical Hebrew, it's, it's referred to as begad kafat, which I find hilarious. Uh, in modern Hebrew, there's only three letters that are affected, and you see this beit, chaf, and fe, um, as opposed to, uh, you know, ba, ka, pe, so beit, uh, kaf, and pe. Um, there's different things that affect when one is spirantized in modern Hebrew, versus in biblical Hebrew. So biblical Hebrew, it's like if it comes after a vowel, even if it's a different word, even if it's a different morpheme, whatever, it gets spirantized. Um, in modern Hebrew, not so much. Uh, the, the rules are a little bit different. Um, and so it's worth kind of uh, memorizing as we go along. Um, I do really like Sippy Littleton's approach here where he says, how do you tell between sheen and seen? And he says, you're reading right to left. Uh, and so if you're reading right to left, the sheen is the one on the shore and the scene is the one by the sea. I use that on a regular basis. Um, it is, it is actually really helpful. Um, so that's all I want to say about the writing system for now. I think, uh, if you want to learn Hebrew, um, then it's a great way to do it. Uh, if I were, so I, I've already started adding a little bit, uh, into my Anki deck. Now, a quick note for those of you just joining, the way that I like to study this stuff, I try to outsource the memorization. I, for years, did not do that. I would, like, grab the book, I'd look at it, I'd, I'd look at it again, I'd try to remember it, I'd try to remember it when I'm walking around, I'd, like, you know, I'd just try to, like, uh, memorize it. Now I outsource that using flashcards. I use Anki, which is a software that does space repetition. You can use whatever you like. You can use physical flashcards. You can use space repetition that's, I don't know, memorize, whatever the, the exists out there that you like. Or you can do whatever works for you. I like Anki. Um, let me rephrase that. I think Anki is effective. I actually loathe Anki, but I do it regularly. Um, and it does space repetition for flashcards. So I'll be making some of those as I continue. But... I've already made a few uh, with my wife for like the first uh, couple of chapters here, so I probably won't be making them. What I will tell you is if you are studying Hebrew, notice here, it says the vowels, hatnuot. That's a Hebrew word. Might as well learn it, right? It can't hurt to learn um, hatnuot. And what I would do, uh, let's see if I can actually do this right now. What I would do is pull up um, the uh, Wiktionary page, for instance. I think you should all see this now. I have a slight delay because I need to be able to moderate comments. Um, so I'll know in a moment if it shows up. And uh, yeah, there we go. And uh, what I'll do is take the word. 
uh, what is this, Tnuot. So I use the QWERTY keyboard because I am lazy. Um, I'm trying to make this as easy as possible for me. Um, and I will type it in. So Tnu, and then it's got the Ein in there. Uh, when I'm memorizing this stuff, I actually think of it um, with the Ein. So I think of this as as Tnuot, but I don't say it that way because that would be ridiculous. So Tnuot, plural of uh, Tnua. And what I might do is make a flashcard where the front side is Tnua. Um, let's see, is that correct? Yes, okay. Um, where the front side is Tnua, the back side is um, vowels or vice versa. I might say like vowel, I'll do a picture that evokes vowels for me. I just Google it. Um, and then I would, uh, on the flip side, have the Hebrew, transliteration, uh, and um, possibly pronunciation. I can go to Forvo, you can record your own voice if you want to, but that's what I do. It's, it's now, I think that's the simplest way to do it. And I would do another one for Tnuot, um, especially if it was an irregular plural, which it's not, but I would definitely do that. Uh, and then um, just continue along. And you'll notice the, the um, uh, Wikipedia also had the word for consonants. That was already in this page, so I would have uh, in the textbook, I would have um, added that as well. That's itzur and uh, itzurim. Um, so, uh, one thing I must tell you: Biblical Hebrew had eight vowels. Uh, modern Hebrew has five. The author of this textbook is a modern Hebrew speaker, a native speaker of modern Hebrew. English has like eighteen vowels, and so. For some reason, textbooks all really like when you have something that's like, you know, like the sound in thus and such word, okay? The problem is, if you come from a language that has a five-vowel system and you're trying to talk about like the word in English, you kind of get it wrong sometimes. It's, it's pretty unavoidable. Um, so this is completely wrong. Uh, on this page. It is delightful to me. Uh, my <laughs> my father-in-law was uh, studying Hebrew and was like, what is going on with these vowels? Because he speaks Ashkenazi liturgical Hebrew um, quite well. It's a weird thing. Like he could probably like, you know, study this textbook and then go, but he would speak it like, you know, if you're, if you're there, um, you know, watching, you know that this is true. Um, but he, he, like has a very high level in that. Um, that has a difference between these. So like this vowel marking, this would be a as in coffee. Uh, this is a as in, I don't know, patach. Um, e, 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 o, u, u, and then a. Uh. And what happens here is <laughs> that she, she's got a five vowel system. So she says that a uh, is like in the word glass. And e eh is in men, which is fine, but it's also sort of e, eh, it, like it, it, any of those sounds, anywhere between like e eh and e eh would be fine. Then she says the i is like the i in heat, and the o in dog, and the u in put. Um, it, it only works with the Hebrew accent. So it's not hit, dog, and put. It's not e, eh, a, ah, and o. Oh. Those are not. Uh, the, the vowels of modern Hebrew, um, those are, those would be considered like, like people would hear it and it'd be like, uh, you're saying the right vowel, but it sounds kind of weird. Um, they have actually changed it in the, in the uh, second edition of the textbook, but it's not 100% correct. So I find this just delightful and on a regular basis now, like make mention of being like, you know, make mention of, of talking about heating or putting. Um, you could get by with I and U. What I think is happening here is that Brits and Americans pronounce the, our long vowels with an off glide. So we have I and we have E. And E sounds like two vowels to a, a native Hebrew speaker. Um, I is basically the same as E within that system. And so they say it's like the one in, in hit because that sounds less like diphthongal, off glidey, multiple vowel-y kind of thing. Um, but for for native English speakers, like this will give you exactly the wrong vowels. Um, so uh, just be aware of that. It's a five vowel system. It's a regular five vowel system. For a native English speaker, it's probably easiest to think about this as like the vowel in heat. Um, let's, I'll, I'll put in a BD frame. So uh, bead, 
um, uh, bed or bed, um, but not bayed, right? Um, ah, so like bod, um, bowed and booed. Uh, it's just, I, I find this just really entertaining. Um, I see in the chat uh, from Lauder Marauder, I often find the mere act of creating flashcards for a word enough to embed the word in memory. No need to review the card. Exactly. Um, I find that just doing that work for the most part helps and then sometimes it really doesn't. I need to see the card a million times. Um, all right. Uh, so this this combination vowels, this is just a, this is like, they're just short vowels. Historically, in, in Biblical Hebrew, it's a combination of like a schwa and a short vowel. So the vowel length distinction is not really as relevant in modern Hebrew um, as it was in Biblical Hebrew. And there's three uh, diphthongs. There's I, oi, a. Okay. Uh, so this is fun. They have their little writing thing. Uh, you can write. This would be sort of childish handwriting, uh, but there's all sorts of cool stuff. Um, I see instruction, how to speak Hebrew with an American British accent. <laughs> Why not? Um, there's some discussion of like, which is worse, the Ashkenazi liturgical accent or the American accent um, for, for, you know, Israelis. And they uh, have strong feelings about both, uh, which is fine. Um, let's see, is the assumption, oh, from Theta Sigma, is the assumption that you were at sea when you began or on the shore? You begin on the shore. You begin your, your sea voyage on the shore. You begin, uh, on the right-hand side, reading right to left. Um, and, uh, let's see, do I have a recommendation for a good dictionary? Ask me next week, because right now I actually don't. I tend to use Wiktionary online, um, for nouns and adjectives, and I use Pealim, online for verbs. Um, and we'll talk more about verbs in later episodes. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, uh, I, I don't actually have a good dictionary recommendation. I mostly do stuff online. Um, so I'm kind of skipping all the rest of this introductory chapter. This is like, you know, can you sound things out? They give you words, mazal. Um, it's, you know, things that you might be, uh, uh things that you might recognize. Um, sus, tut, hu, you know, they're just giving you examples of all the sounds. Uh, they do give you some basic vocabulary, so don't skip this if you're studying the language. Um, you're going to miss some of this stuff. Uh, and what I would do for these, I'm not going to do it right now um, for myself, but I will actually show you. What I would do is, do, 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 I would open up my um, folder that has the audio. I think the audio is mostly the same uh, between, um, between editions. I would find the track. So let's see what track this is. The driver greets Peter with... Mm, that's not it. Um, her voice is... <laughs> the, the narrator voice for Persian is a little more uh, pleasant, I think. Now let's go on to the vowels. Now let's go on to As the vowels. As many consonants... Con Apart from foreign words, Hebrew generally... Stre Have a go at a role play. Unit two. Peter B. Right, so Have a go at a role play and answer according to the prompts. Apart from foreign words, Hebrew generally stresses the last syllable. Let's now go through your first vocabulary list. There we go. Which right. you'll find in... So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to open this in Audacity. Audacity is a free open source platform uh, that you can use for audio, all sorts of stuff. Um, the name's kind of a pun. Uh, the reason that I do this in Audacity is because I can manipulate it in a way that's useful for me making uh, Anki flashcards. So I'm just going to walk you all through this. This is kind of a cool thing. Um, I'm going to move Audacity over to the screen that you can see. Here we go. And what I would do, first of all, you can already tell which part's Hebrew and which part is uh, narration. Um, so I'd come over to, I don't know, here. Aval. And I have that word, right? The first word, aval. Um, aval. She's kind of listing them in pairs, uh, by the way, when you listen to this. Aval. Mazal. Notice that, like, it's the same vowel, but it's a little bit different in the closed syllable. It's almost like it's a little closer to a. Ah. Um, I wouldn't pronounce it as a, ah, like English a, ah, but it's a little more forward in the closed syllable. So um, what I would do here is I would take, I want to get all those vocabulary words. I would take all this, delete it. I would then go to analyze. Uh, let me actually select everything first. Select everything, analyze. Watch this for making flashcards. This is going to be great. Uh, silence finder. Um, you can play around with the threshold for what constitutes silence, minimum duration, and so on. Um, this one's really easy. Hit OK. 
boom, you got all the silences. What you can then do is export these uh, multiply into a folder. So I can go file, export, export, multiple. And then uh, this is track six, but I could, I could name it track, track six split. Um, and then I'm not going to do this because I already know these vocabulary, but if I did this, just hit export. And what it does is it will give me every single one of these as its own little audio file. And then what I can do is in Anki, um, that's still Hebrew. Uh, in Anki, I can, uh, then drag and drop the audio to the reverse side of my card. So my card would have like but in English, I might have a picture from Google Maps, or not Google Maps, from Google Images that's like somebody, if it's evocative of saying like, however. Um, and then on the flip side, I would have aval in Hebrew. So Aleph, Beit, Lamed. I would have transliteration, A-V-A-L, and I would have the audio. And that's, that's how I roll. Um, so I think this is a really great use of the audio. It's a really great use of Anki. And it's an easy way of just splitting things up. Uh, that make it really, really effective. So just to, to give an example, like uh, really just work the whole example, um, I would have but, I might say conjunction for myself. I would go to, do, do, do. I would go to some sort of image search. So um, do I dare search for but? Uh, probably not smart. Let's find out. But. Okay, not the worst. Um, so, I don't know. Of course, I'm getting butts. Um, let's try however. I might even just use, like, however here. It doesn't really matter. Um, just something that can, can be a mnemonic for me. And I would drag that in. Um, I'd, you know, put my, my word here. And the back, I would say, since I'm already still in English, I'd have aval. I would switch to Hebrew and have aval. And then I would drag and drop the audio in here, and that's my flashcard. And I do, you know, maybe 15 uh, a day, 15 new a day, 150 review. Um, I'm not going to add this one because it is, I already know it. <laughs> and then just keep it moving. Um, I see this is life-changing from uncurling lifelines. I'm glad that this is helpful. I, I think, you know, even if you're not learning Hebrew, this is uh, hopefully useful for everybody. Um, by the way, now's a great time to say like, subscribe. Uh, you can thank me with super chat and super thanks. You know, I've, I'm trying to remember to say those things more on my channel. Um, obviously, you don't have to, um, but I always do appreciate it. So um, why does the image help? Uh, yeah, the image, uh, I don't know. It does. It, like, it plugs into a different part of your brain, and it just helps. Um, I have found that there are certain things that like once I add an image, it's just immediately better. That was actually the main draw. So I worked for um, years for Rosetta Stone. I worked in Grand Central Terminal at a kiosk in a hallway that I later found out was mildly radioactive, but can only really harm you if you're there for, you know, eight hours a day, five days a week for years, which I was. Um, but I used Rosetta Stone uh, before, like back in 2000. 6, 2007, worked for them starting in 2008. And uh, the main draw for me, I realized, was the audio and the images. And then what happens is you work there and you do all the different languages. And, you know, I studied Arabic with it and ended up not learning much of anything. Um, but that's because at that point I had basically memorized, you see the same images across every course. So um, now I can tell you what the images are, but I don't necessarily know <laughs> the words in a language. But if you want to say like, you know, playing in, in Farsi, I know it's like, um, you know, Boazi Cardan. Um, but I have the image of like a father kicking a soccer ball and a little boy like, you know, sitting sadly by a tree, um, just seared into my mind. I might not be able to recover the word for playing in another language like Italian that I'd studied with Rosetta Stone, but I have the image. Um, when it's one language, it just, for some reason, it sears it into your brain a little bit more. Um, one thing that I talked about in previous live streams is what I call naughty mnemonics. Um, so, uh... What that means is 
There's a fair amount of research that indicates that one, mnemonics work, which annoys me because I hate them, but they work. And um, two, things get, they're more memorable. They lodge themselves in your brain better if they are related in some way to something that is high arousal. And I don't mean just sexual arousal. I mean like any kind of arousal. So violence, fear, um, you know, thirst, whatever it is, um, sex, drugs, and rock and roll, those kind of things, those help really lock things into your brain. So I have very puerile, childish, scatological, you know, sex-related, whatever, mnemonics for tons and tons and tons of words. And it is silly, it is puerile, it is juvenile, it is sometimes offensive, and it is also very effective. Um, so I, I joke around about naughty, naughty mnemonics. Uh, anybody who's on the Persian uh, live streams will probably remember how to say nearby from a naughty mnemonic. Um, but uh, yeah, mnemonics work anything that's like high um, emotional or intellectual arousal, anything that like turns your amygdala on. Uh, which is like fear, arousal, like whatever. That helps. And then images help because it's another neural pathway. It's another way of, of doing it. And I have no idea why an image should help because like it shouldn't necessarily be related. Like if I have a picture of um, grapes and I'm trying to remember anavim, um, the fact of thinking of grapes, I mean, yes, I'm trying to map the word to the, to the concept, but having a particular image that like pops into mind, it will activate the word for me. Um, it's like magic. Uh, I see Toastback Well says it, it gives the brain like more things to grab onto, so to speak, and that's exactly, exactly right. Um, I see also in the chat, uh, uh, Rick says, uh, image only is even better for tr than translation, associate with a feeling, not a translation. I agree in principle, but um, I worked for Rosetta Stone for too long and I was all in on no translation. And then I found that actually translating, describing, analyzing, um, kind of helps me a little bit more. <laughs> um, so the idea, the end goal should be have a thought or a feeling and communicate it in your target language without going through English. Um, so that is, uh, we agree there. The question is where necessary, you know, can translation be a little helpful? And I think it can be. Um, it can also be really harmful. Like there's certain concepts in Hebrew, in particular in like liturgical Hebrew, like chesed. If I translate that as kindness or loving or whatever, like I'm missing everything. So you kind of like, you need to get that whole semantic field and images may be better there than, than translation. Um, let's see, uh, we're going to go to, we're going to skip all the reading stuff, which is kind of fun. Um, except for, I'm going to point out, uh, dip, dip, mini, uh, mini cracker. Uh, so deep, deep, mini cracker, um, or deep, deep. Um, by the way, Hebrew is a language that before I had studied it, um, it was one of those that I just could not identify. It was like, what am I hearing? I hear a French R, I hear what sounds like Russian spoken in French spoken in Arabic like it just didn't make any sense um, and uh, if you can make a French R then the modern Hebrew R is going to be useful to you I have a pet theory about this um, historically it used to be Ra this is known when it changed is up for debate but there's a I think a convincing uh, dissertation that somebody wrote a couple years back that kind of puts it at around 200 AD. Um, and so there's an interesting thing, the European R in French and German, the sort of Sprachbund R, um, is also present in uh, Yiddish. And there's kind of a chicken or the egg question with Hebrew and Yiddish. So there, the people will claim that modern Hebrew has like a European R and it's like, uh, it's European language, it's all these Europeans speaking it, and yada, yada, yada. First of all, like 60 to 70% of modern of, of Israelis are uh, Mizrahi, Sephardi. They're not, like they didn't, their ancestors did not come from Europe. Um, but second of all, I have this kind of, I mean, I can't prove it. This is not linguistically valid. This is not published anywhere. This is my like thought experiment. One, the, the Raz just become Raz. So that can happen independently. And that's probably the most likely explanation. But I also kind of wonder like, could it have been like a Hebrew influence on like Yiddish, Yiddish in the marketplace affecting German, German and French? Like, I don't, if you, if you know about this, it's, um, it's, uh, 
uh, you know, leave me a comment, but it's something that I, I think about. Like, I stay up at night thinking about this. Um, so chapter two, you're following, uh, <laughs> with the excursion is over, we're following uh, Peter Green. Um, I see uh, Ganpik says your R is unvoiced. You mean mine or, uh, I don't know. So there's, there's, um, there's also a lot to say about like how the R is actually realized. Um, so it's not really like a ra, except for when people are speaking really carefully. Um, it gets, there's some interesting corners of the IPA that, that you have to start using to, to describe um, uh, Hebrew. So if you're using this textbook, uh, here's how I would do this. Um, what I recommend is not doing it in order. So first thing, um, what I did with the, uh, the Persian textbook was actually like set myself, I'm going to do this many chapters and this much time and like look at it. But uh, whatever you're doing, like whatever your pace is, let's take uh, chapter two where Peter arrives in Israel and says, in this unit you will learn. Pay attention to that. That's what we're going to look at. Um, second is what I would do is not go, okay, dialogue one, let me listen, let me read it in Hebrew. Okay, here's transliteration. Okay, here's English. What I would do is look at the vocabulary first. Don't dump it into Anki yet. Just look at the vocabulary first. And we have things like Nehag Monit, so taxi driver, Slicha. Um, taxi driver, by the way, Nehag Monit, I would absolutely have De Niro on my flashcard. Like, hands down, it's going to be like, you talking to me? Um, that's my Nehag Monit. Um, and I might even think like, Nehag Monit, like, you talking to me? Um, that's how my brain works. You have uh, Baruch Haba, you have, you know, basic terms, Malon, Achshav, right now, Bevakasha, um, Sheket, Bevakasha. And then what I would do, I looked at these words, then I would read the dialogue in English, so I know how they're going to fit together. Then... I would read it in, in the transliteration and listen to it. And then later, I might uh, actually listen to it and read it with the, with the script. And then once I've done those things, uh, what I would do is divide up the audio. Um, I see, you guys see my screen. I have some peculiarities of Mississippi speech. Um, that's an 1893 book. It is really interesting, but it's not what we're talking about. All right, so I would divide up the audio. I would take track eight. Unit two. Peter be Israel. Peter arrives in Israel. Dialogue one. Peter Green has arrived in Israel and is met at the airport by a taxi driver who will take him to his hotel in Tel Aviv. Chaim. Slicha, ata mar Green? Ken, ani Peter Green. Shalom, baruch haba Israel. Okay, so... Uh, First of all, what I might do on this track, because this is super duper annoying, is I would take this noise profile. Here's an extra tip for Audacity. I would then analyze it. I would go to um, Effect, Noise Reduction, Get Noise Profile, Select All. Actually, first of all, I'll delete the, her, her talking, because that actually doesn't have the noise. All right, Select All. Um, I can hit Command R and it'll just redo the noise effect. And look at this. I have less noise in my flashcards. I don't need to have a background that's pretending it's Tel Aviv Airport. No, I'm not a All right, so I'd just be breaking these up, dumping them into, into flashcards. Um, I could use Forvo or Norfix or something for the um, uh, pronunciations and all that. And that is how I would actually learn this stuff. Um, but, you know, I might listen to it once or two, once or twice or three times through to just, you know listen to the dialogue. Um, when I'm making flashcards, I'm not going to try to make it so it fits the dialogue. So if it's like, Ani itonai, I don't care if it relates to whatever I did before. I just need something that's itonai. What I might also do is look up the feminine. Um, so itonait, uh, I believe. Uh, I'm stressing it. I probably shouldn't have contrastive focus in English. Um, but itonai, itonait. Um, I see a really good question and a couple of really good questions in the chat. So um, let me... Let me do this. So uh, one person says some dialects of Iraqi Arabic have a guttural R. Yes, that's awesome. Um, and some dialects of Hebrew have an apical R. So, you know, it's it's interesting. Um, let's see. 
it says, to my knowledge, Hebrew is still spoken with a rolled R until a few decades ago in some places, but in others, no. And the change to the uvular R happened around between 200 and 700 AD. There's discussion in the Gemara about like, which is the proper pronunciation. Um, and like I said, I, I, maybe I'll find it, I'll link it um, afterwards in the comments or I'll share it next week or something. There's a great dissertation about this, like tracking when it happened. Um, all right, does learning modern Hebrew help with learning biblical Hebrew? Yes, but uh, one thing that I would recommend is if you wanna learn biblical Hebrew and you don't really care about modern Hebrew, a um, couple of good books. But uh, this one's easier, um, but less nuanced. Um, this is Learn Biblical Hebrew 2nd Edition by John Dobson. And this is the one that I teach from um, in the, the class that I teach on this, the Shior that I teach on this, which is Thomas Lambden, Introduction to Biblical Hebrew. He taught at uh, Harvard for a long time. It is aggressive, and it's like being a philologist's grammar, but it's really good. Um, and I think I have Amazon links to those somewhere, like on my website or something. Um, uh, I can always find that before the end. So, uh, then I got to another question. Christopher uh, Ptak, uh, tell me if I'm saying that right. Are the H's in Zayn Ata pronounced or just there to indicate there was an H, uh, there was a, uh, a hey at the end? Um, they're not pronounced. Um, the transliteration is inconsistent here. And that's actually a really important point. So, there are three instances in which by the late biblical period Hebrew had added vowels. One is Yud. So like in Slicha, actually Slicha is a good example of two of them. Um, one is this long E sound. One is Vav for O or U. And often at the end of a word, also sometimes like a V sound now, but it was W in biblical Hebrew. Um, so like elav would have been pronounced like elau, uh, which is very weird to hear. And the other is hey. Now hey sometimes was pronounced as an H, but for the most part was just indicative of a vowel at the end of the word that wasn't E and wasn't U or O. So it, it fills in for like A or A. Um, so here's licha. Um, you'll see this in like uh, to see things, roe, roa. Um, you'll see this in like uh, to drink, shote, shota, ani shote. Zelomayim, Nechayim. Um, ooh, I feel like it's getting stronger. Um, but the H is there, the He is there in Hebrew, just to indicate that there's a vowel there. It's either A or A, usually. And then in the transliteration, a lot of people just add that in the transliteration. So she has KH for Cha, and then the H here, this is not pronounced, it's not Slichach, Slicha. Ata Margreen, um, you would sound like you're, you know, out of breath or having some sort of problem. Um, and you'll see things too, like uh, apostrophes used here. The apostrophe used here is just indicating that that's a clitic. It's not like B Tel Aviv, it's B Tel Aviv. Um, again, B Vakasha. So this is B, not, you know, B Vakasha. Uh, it's, it's a little... It's a little inconsistent. Um, it's kind of kind of interesting. Uh, I see here some other discussion. Um, do, 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 overlap between modern and biblical. Yes, okay. Uh, what would I do if I wanted a Yemenite accent? Learn Arabic. Uh, you can join me tomorrow for that. And use the older pronunciations. So, chet would be pronounced ha. Huh. Um, ein would be pronounced a. Ein. And aleph would be pronounced like an aleph. And kof, instead of being like a k sound, would be ka, like Oof. Um, and that'll be a good start. That's all I can say for now because I'm not exactly an expert on Yemenite Hebrew. So uh, this is like very, very simple at the beginning. And you'll notice, what are they teaching you? They're teaching you obviously greetings, um, basic stuff, hotel, right? Taxi. These are, <laughs> you know, professor, journalist. These are, these are sort of important things. And then they teach you, um, I'm from this place, this and that. So cultural note, greetings, great. Language points, the noun sentence. This is like many languages, everything from Russian to African American English, but definitely Hebrew. Uh, in, in many cases, languages allow for the deletion or just not having at all any verbal copula in the present tense. And so you have, look at the sentence, Ani Peter Green, and that is, I, Peter Green. Not I am Peter Green, not I was Peter Green, not I will be, just I, Peter Green. 
So um, that's the present tense uh, with with verbal copula. Um, apropos of biblical Hebrew, which uh, people uh, have been asking about, one thing that I want to point out, modern Hebrew has tenses. And we'll talk a lot about those later as we get to them. Biblical Hebrew did not have tenses. It had aspect. And there's arguments about what the, what the, um, how exactly to think about the two verbal forms. Um, many scholars refer to the two verbal forms as the suffix form and the prefix form, rather than taking a strong stance on like, is it perfect, imperfect, is it perfective, is it like, you know, what kind of aspect it is. But the bottom line is one is about sort of completed actions, and one is about actions that are ongoing and not yet complete. And that can be in the future. I will be reading a book. That can be in the past. I was reading a book. That can be in the present. Um, modern Hebrew, the present tense, derives from the gerund. So like running is a thing that I do. Um, or the participle, like uh, uh, I'm trying to think of uh, uh, the best way to explain this. But it's, it's, it's like not the, the regular verb form. That is where modern Hebrew got the present tense. That's why the present tense in modern Hebrew verbs, which we'll see in a moment, only has four forms instead of all of these like first person singular, first person plural, second person singular feminine, second person singular masculine, second person uh, singular, you know, second person plural feminine, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so uh, it's just worth knowing if you are using modern Hebrew to study biblical Hebrew, you're going to have a weird sense of what's going on because the uh, conjugation of verbs looks the same, but it means completely different things. And that, that change started in like 400 BC and it was basically done to like what it is in the modern sense by like the medieval period, like the 15, 1600s. Um, so it's very like, you can't just read the Tanakh and expect that it's going to be, you know, that modern Hebrew has you understand what the verbs actually mean. Um, so they talk about questions. How do you make questions? They talk about negation. Um, using lo, which is very easy, and then inseparable prepositions. Now, I want to address something um, that my wife asked, um, and I thought this was super interesting. Um, I'm assuming, because nap time started right when I started this, that I can go for a little while longer. Um, so I'm going to continue a little while longer. For those of you who are <laughs> new to the channel, I'm referring to nap time for my daughter. Um, so I think I'm good. Uh, but um, there's an interesting thing here about the inseparable prepositions. So there's uh, la and uh, ba. Um, I don't even think we've gotten here in the, in the text, but um, to the and in the, instead of, you know, le ha and be ha, you get la and ba. The H disappears. This is a change that happened like 3,000 years ago. Now, H's disappearing um, is a thing that I just, I keep trying to hammer home. That's like what happens in languages. They, the H's disappear. Um, so that change happened like 2000 years ago. A different change with H's is happening in modern Hebrew right now where all of the other H's are basically disappearing. Um, so it's worth listening carefully when you learn the definite article like ha, meaning the, nobody says ha. Very few people say it that way. Um, you have to be listening for ah, uh, which is kind of uh, a challenge. Um, so it's worth, it's worth listening to that. The other thing um, in terms of listening skills is that a lot of word final T's are slightly aspirated, at least to my ear. What that means is that we native English speakers tend to hear them as like the beginning of a syllable because that's the only place where we aspirate our T's. But it means that we syllabify Hebrew wrong you know, when we hear it spoken quickly, if we're not like really on our game or familiar with the vocab. Um, I see, which is harder, French or Hebrew? For an English speaker, Hebrew, hands down. Um, the French, for those of you who don't know your history, conquered England in 1066 with Guillaume le Conquérant, with William the Conqueror. And um, we have tons and tons and tons and tons and tons and tons and tons of words from French. Um, it's also not super distant as far as like European languages go. It's obviously a Romance language and not a Germanic language like English is, but it's like not that different. Hebrew, Templatic morphology, uh, there's not a lot of overlap with words. Like there's just not like, it's just, it doesn't give you as much. It doesn't even give you the vowels. You can't even read for, for pleasure and like learn new words that way if it's not voweled. 
So uh, let's continue. Dialogue two. They give you some more stuff. Uh, good evening. I'm Peter Green. Right. This is exactly how I would do it is like either vocabulary or the, the English first. So pleased to meet you. I'm Boris and this is my girlfriend, Sonia. Uh, where are you from? I'm from England. Yada, yada, yada. I'm going to look at these. Um, Erev. Uh, Erev Tov. Naim Meod. These are like formulas that you would use. Um, I see Tal go and saying what's uh, going on with ancient Hebrew nowadays is painful to to witness. And Ryan said, like the H in Opital in French, exactly like the H in Opital or the S in Opital, um, which is why there's a little hat on the O. Uh, <laughs> um, I have a here's here's story time for French, by the way. I have a um, cousin, uh, Jean Philippe. I assume you're not watching this, but if you are, uh, here's to you, Chaim. Um, my wife can correct me if it was Jean-Philippe or Jean-Fred or jean Bob. I think it was Jean-Philippe who said this. Um, anyway, uh, he was saying, we were drinking a Côte du Rhône. And uh, for those of you who don't know how that's spelled, it's C-O with a little hat on it, T-E, and the Rhône is similarly R-H-O with a little hat on it. And he was saying, uh, you know, you should, you should uh, pronounce it with a long vowel because that's more correct. It's Côte du Rhône. And I said... He said, does anybody know why? Being a linguist, I was like, I know why. That used to be an S there. And he's like, exactly. And then I said, so why don't you just say the S? And he said, that would be ridiculous. And I just found this absolutely hilarious because it's like, you know, the older, the 300-year-old version of French is correct, but the 400-year-old version is just absurd. Um, <laughs> like, just like language changes, it happens. Um, so now we have a running gag, uh, you know, my wife and I and my mom and, you know, friends and family about having, ordering a Côte du Rhône, where we just make it as long a vowel as we can, um, because, you know, got to make the long vowel. All right, let's see. Um, I have an example of uh, all this stuff. Track nine is probably an exercise. The driver greets Peter. Yeah. Listen carefully to the questions. The next exercise is exercise. I feel like she's just talking like you know like i i just want to go uh, like every time i hear her like oh, the next exercise um dialogue two peter meet all right so we're gonna listen to dialogue two and we're gonna listen for the h's because he this messed me up the first time i listened to it and it is uh it is delightful to me now um because i know what i'm listening for so let's do this um she's gonna introduce it we'll just dialogue do two Peter meets some Israelis in the hotel bar later on that evening. Erev Tov. Ani Peter Green. Naim meod. Ani Boris Alexandrov vezot ha'chavera sheli Sonia. Naim meod. Shalom Peter. Me'ayin ata? Ani me'Anglia. Efer ta gar be'Anglia? Ani gar be'Oxford. U me'ayin atem? Atem ta'yarim? Anachnu me'Rusia, aval anachnu lo ta'yarim. Anachnu garim po ba'aretz. Okay, so... I just want to draw your attention to some stuff. I might use prot for some of this. Maybe not. Um, Erev Tov. Ani Peter Green. Naim meod. Ani Boris Alexandrov vezot ha'chavera shel... Right. Alexandrov vezot... Alexandrov vezot ha'chavera shel... Vezot ha'chavera shel Sonia. That is like... The first time you hear it for native English speakers often very hard. Vezot ha'chavera shel Sonia. And he's actually trying to say the H there. Shalom Peter, And similarly, if you listen, ta, ta, that sounds like a syllable initial, like a like a word initial uh, thing in uh, in um, English. So, you know, an English speaker might struggle and parse this as like meaina ta, as in, in, as opposed to meaina. Ata. Um, just things to be aware of as you're listening to like better parse the language. Um, just, I, I don't know, I find that particularly challenging. I see, please no prod on the live stream. Your wish is my command. Um, I don't think it's, it's, it's a holiday. I'm drinking not water. I don't think I can handle prod right now anyway. Um, let's see, time to look in the, in the chat. I'll say it again, the best Hebrew dictionary is Morphix. Look it up. I'm going to look it up right now. Um, I better not regret this. I won't do it on this screen, just in case. Oh, uh, that is still in Hebrew. Morphix. Let's try this in English. Morphix. Dot, is it dot com? Dot co dot il. That's already very promising. All right, here's what we're working with. Best Hebrew dictionary. Uh, can we have English, please? This already looks very useful. 
so let's do hotels. Why not? The reason I do that is because they teach Malone. Uh, Duolingo teaches Beit Malone and Bate Malone. But uh, I've ah, here we go. Malone, Beit Malone. Does this have the plural? Very cool. Okay, Wikipedia. Lots going on here. There's a lot going on on this uh, on this site. Do we have a plural? Because I the older version of this book teaches that the plural is uh, malonot, which is unusual. This looks like a pretty useful tool. All right, me'ayin is archaic. They actually mention that in the textbook. People say me'ayin. Me'ayin is like, from from whither do you come? Um, I think Belgian French still lengthens vowels when they have hats, but not entirely sure. Um, <laughs> I parse that as when the Belgians are wearing hats, they have longer vowels. <laughs> so they say, uh, Coduron, Coduron. Um, uh, but yes, I, I take your point. Uh, May Ein is archaic. No proud on the live stream. You got it. Memnun um, Uldum. I think, yeah, sounds similar to Turkish. My Turkish pronunciation is going to be awful. I apologize. Um, but uh, uh, yeah, uh, <laughs> I think it's related because Turkish uh, has some, some borrowings from Arabic and positions from Arabic uh, that um, are related. Hebrew is related to Arabic. They're, they're closely related languages. Um, this is just like a, they, they develop differently. Um, whence? Thank you. Thank you, Mark. What did I say? Whither? That's, yeah. Uh, you can tell how often I use uh, hither, thither, whither, and whence. Um, let's see. Is there any chance for a non-native speaker to learn the modern Hebrew R? Absolutely. Why not? Um, so if you, uh, what I would do, I'll do it right now. We're going to, we're going to get a basic approximation and then we're going to get a little better. So we're going to go to Google. We're going to type Hebrew. We're going to actually, we're going to type Hebrew phonology. That will be the lazy way of going to the Wikipedia article about it. Uh, it's got all sorts of good stuff, oriental and non-oriental accents. Um, Dude, Oriental is not the preferred nomenclature. Um, all right. Uh, it's got all of your IPA here. Let me just make this bigger. Boom, boom, boom. And then look at this. Uh, velar or uvular fricative, and it's got two different versions, ha and ra. Uh, these are your R's. Um, there's some footnotes for these. So usually pronounced as a uvular approximate, sometimes as a uvular trill depending on the background of the speaker. So we're going to go learn the uvular approximate. Um, this is a voiced uvular fricative. Um, that's the starting point, And then the approximate is less tense. Uh, so what does this mean? This is a uh, voiced uvular approximate is found interchangeably. It may also be written that way. Um, its manner of articulation is fricative, which means it is produced by... Uh, has a big tongue. Uh, it is produced by constricting the airflow. Um, <laughs> uh, constricting the airflow through a narrow channel at the place of articulation, causing turbulence. Um, in many languages, it's close to an approximate, which means just less friction. The place of articulation is uvular, which means articulated with the back of the tongue um, at the uvula. That's the little dangly bit. Its phonation is voiced, which means the vocal cords vibrate during the articulation. It is oral, which, which means air is allowed to escape through the mouth only. Um, and it is central, meaning you don't direct things laterally like an L. The airstream mechanism is pulmonic, meaning it is you use your lungs. So that's a description, where you make it, how you make it, but what does that actually translate to? Ra, a ra. I might listen to it. Ra, a ra. That's my best approximation. You can try yours. You may find that you're going like ra or, I don't know, ra, or whatever it is. Uh, in which case, I would recommend recording yourself, recording this, and then just... Ra, a ra. Now, this is just IPA, like the, the International Phonetic Association um, version of this. Ra, a ra. That sounds more a like ra. Hebrew. Ra, a ra, a ra. So, ra, a ra, a ra. Practice that play the audio of yourself back and just try to like 
rinse and repeat. And by rinse and repeat, somebody said gargle some mouthwash and then do it less so. So yeah, and then rinse and repeat. So and then and then la ah ah. Um, and everything in language, language change is always just you know whatever you learn as as the formal thing way of doing it. Just do it less so, and you're gonna have like the cutting edge way of doing it. Um, so, uh, who asked that? Praha, uh, hopefully that answered your question. Um, and then it's just practice. I will not say by any means that my Hebrew accent is going to be like, uh, native sounding or fluent sounding. I'm, my plan is to be fluent, intelligible. Um, and I'm fine if I sound like an intelligent American who just sounds better than the other Americans. So I don't say like a and all that stuff. Um, because I'm studying Georgian on and off, and they have the same sound, but in literature it's transcribed as GH. That's exactly how it's transcribed in Persian as well. I like thinking of these um, as like a, as a as a GH sound personally. I'm gonna if I'm gonna use that instead of an R, because R we tend to go ra ra that kind of stuff. It's not as helpful. Um, how do you handle learning gender in Hebrew? I that's a great question, um, and I will get there uh, in like. How about now? Um, <laughs> so uh, different languages have gender. Hebrew has two. Um, Zulu has like 14. Um, some people say 17, but they, they, it's really 14. Um, so gender is not um, uh, sex. It's not the sex of an item. Um, and uh, if any of you have watched my overly long video on pronouns, you'll know that I have lots of thoughts on gender and language. Um, but the thing to, to recognize is that gender, there's two genres. Um, and genre is related. And I, I, I think it's easy to think of in terms of genre. And what it does is it categorizes nouns and then helps you keep track of what's going on in a sentence because the adjectives that go with one noun or another noun, they they agree, they take on endings or whatever, so they, they, they have to match that noun. Um, it is usually not semantic. So um, in this textbook, I think she talks about learning genders and says you have to memorize them, and we say he or she instead of it for inanimate objects. That is true, but it's kind of a weird way of thinking about it. They say who or he. Um, I think uh, it's somewhere in... Uh, Maybe it's in the new edition and not in the older edition, but it's somewhere after the um, the uh, pronouns discussion. Um, so one thing that I like, uh, if you have a really hard time with it, Gabriel Weiner has a really good approach to this um, in languages, especially that don't like give you any hints. In um, he uses German as an example. Uh, there's a lot of morphological hints. So one of the things is a lot of languages give you a hint because the morphology, the, the shape of the word tells you. So in general, in Hebrew, if it ends with an a ah or it ends with an it, it's feminine. Um, there's a handful of like weird exceptions where the morphology doesn't line up with it. So like there's some words where it looks um, masculine or like the plural looks masculine and the Singular looks feminine, and you just have to memorize those. Uh, but in general, Hebrew is pretty straightforward with the morphology, with those exceptions. So, for instance, um, Lila, uh, night, that's masculine for some reason. I have no idea why, but that one's an exception. Um, a lot of them, if you um, if you uh, if you follow um, if you're familiar with any of the the liturgy, you're gonna have mnemonics for that. So, like Lila. If you're familiar with Judaism at all, then your mnemonic for that is just going to be Manishtana Halayla Haze, right? Like, that's it. Halayla Haze, done. Um, if you are unfamiliar with that, then you're going to have to make like a flashcard <laughs> and be like, what is, the, what is the gender that this goes with? Um, so that's, uh, uh, that's that. Um, I see, um, okay, uh, yeah, so far so good in the chat. Um, so, uh, yeah, in general, ah, uh, eat, those are going to be feminine, um, and then ending in a consonant, most likely to be masculine. There's going to be a handful of exceptions that you have to, to deal with, but it's, it's not terrible. What I will say is, um, you know, in English, we, ha we talk about he and she for, like, animals and stuff, but that's only where they're, like, where we know the sex. Like, cows, actually still, I think a lot of people would call a cow it instead of she, 
but it would not be wrong to call a cow she or a bull it. It would be weird to call an insect he or she. Um, I do that sometimes. It upsets people. Um, like mosquitoes. Only the female mosquitoes bite. But if you know that and you refer to a mosquito as she, people get weirded out by it. Um, whereas in Hebrew, like charak, um, you have to say who, uh, which is the word for he. Now, uh, this is where we get to the um, obligatory... Um, I see they just said, is that for Pesach? Yeah, I'm ahead of the game right now. I'm, I'm, I'm anticipating. Um, um, there's actually like another one for, that's a day-to-day -day thing is like um, the word for year. The plural looks masculine, but it's actually feminine. So the, the adjective is feminine. So like shanima tovot, like the, like, like good years. Um, so it's, I honestly just like, that's how I memorize most of them. It's just having something with an adjective. Um, all right, here's where we get into the obligatory, like Hebrew pronouns are hard for English speakers because he is who, she is he, um, who is me. Uh, like, it, it's just uh, the way it is. <laughs> <laughs> and so the pronouns sound Egyptian, which is neat. Yeah, it's related, man. It's uh, Arabic, huwa, right? Like, uh, um, uh, same thing, him, hen, um, for the feminine. Now, a couple of things here worth looking at. Um, uh, do, 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 so who he, anachnu, um, you, and then, so the plurals here. Atem, aten, hem, hen. Um, notice. What is you? It's at, ata, right? The masculine has this suffix. Um, first things first, that's an exception that's kind of a mess. So ata looks like it should be feminine. In other languages, it would be feminine. In Hebrew, ata is masculine. So that's just an exception you have to memorize. It pops up everywhere. You can't avoid it. So you need to know that. Um, um, at is the, is, the, uh, is the feminine. Now, look at this. The plural is just at with M for masculine, N for feminine. The third person looks exactly like the third person, who and he, but with M and N tacked on. So we can morphologically decompose these in a meaningful way where like third person is H, right? Ha. Huh? And then you have a masculine feminine and you have a masculine plural, feminine plural. And those plural markers are exactly the same as go on the second person. Like it's, it's, a, it's a system where you can break it apart and um, it's, I find it a little bit easier to memorize that way because I see there's a pattern there. Instead of memorizing, what is this, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten words, um, I can memorize, uh, well, we can simplify that like third person, you end up with one root and, you know, three things that go off it or four things that go off it. And the second person, you can simplify it to one root and a couple of things that go off of it. And it's like, it's a little bit easier than just all of these individual sort of mental entries. Um, oh, I see in the chat, Nashim. Nashim is a great exception. That's the, the, the plural of women, um, <laughs> which is uh, morphologically masculine. So you get like, you know, Nashim Tovot, good women, um, instead of Nashim Tovim. Uh, I'm getting ahead of the textbook. Um, so if you're going through this, uh, they're still giving you like, say the professor, say the hotel in the lobby, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and then as was discussed in the chat, they do talk about EFO is being what's used now. People say me um, or me EFO, me EFO, me ein, you might hear in like formal speeches and, and broadcasts, but other than that, you're probably going to hear me EFO. Um, and it's kind of a thing, like if you're using Duolingo, um, they're going to be very, very, uh, meticulous about how they pronounce things, um, where they will use like the most formal way of pronouncing things, um, where people simplify things. A lot of times it's around like spiritization of bait to bait and so on. Um, it's, it's definitely, uh, like very, very formal and you'll learn may I am there. Um, so, uh, yeah. Google is, by the way, Google, YouTube is telling me to insert an ad right now. I'm not going to do it. I, I switched it. I had somebody who was really upset because they had, they had to sit through like a, a pre-roll ad. And this was rolling mid-roll ads and stuff as people were watching the live stream. And then you missed like a 30 seconds or a minute. So I am not inserting an ad. Um, but uh, what I will say is uh, maybe tell your friends if you like the live stream. Um, maybe, you know, watch on the replay or something. Maybe watch a video. Um, 
So, because I am sparing you of the ads right now, even though YouTube is telling me to do it. Um, all right. Uh, yeah, here we go. This is uh, a point. I thought it came earlier. Unlike English, I'll put this back on the screen for you. Uh, unlike English, ooh, that's a good comment. I'm gonna I'm gonna read in just a moment. So, unlike English, uh, yeah, I'm looking at the colloquial Hebrew uh, volume one. So, AC, yes, uh, looks familiar. I mentioned, I think I left this way up in the chat, but it's, uh, if you want to buy it, I have a link for version two, which has some corrections. I'm looking at um, uh, the first edition. Um, it's pretty good. I like it. Uh, so uh, they say uh, it never referred to anything as it because there isn't an it. So it's either he or she, depending on the grammatical gender. And just remember, it's grammatical gender, not the sex of a, of a creature. Um, although those do tend to line up in animals like cows and whatever. Uh, you'll find it helpful to remember that names of countries and cities are always feminine, as are the words for country, Eretz and city, Ir. Um, so there you have it. That's, uh, I think, a really good thing. Uh, let's see. Funny that English people say in feminist context, history instead of history. Well, in Hebrew, the feminine aspect is already embedded. Um, <laughs> I see. <laughs> Historia. <laughs> um, yeah, so do I, if I am not feeling kenuf, should I, should I make it historia? <laughs> that sounds terrible. It sounds really bad. Um, all right, uh, I'm just going to take a quick look at the end here of, of uh, chapter two, and then, you know, maybe chapter three or four in the next live stream. Um, they're doing just a few more words. This is Jan, Um So he's from Holland. And then you're really hammering home, Naim Meod, Naim Meod, Matose, Barats. He says, Are you a tourist? Tayar, Lob Diuk, Anim Veker, Mishpacha, the Chavarim, Veani Gampol, Asakim. So that's a lot. I would break that up. I would do vocab words for each one of those, and then I would do the audio. And I might even break the audio into Lob Diuk and then the rest of the sentence. Um, so, uh, yeah. And there's all sorts of. Um, uh, cultural things that make Hebrew easier. So I encourage you, if you are familiar, if, uh, you know, if you are Jewish, if you are familiar with Jewish culture, um, look for the connections. Lo b'diuk is not exactly, but uh, b'diuk, uh, that's, that's B-D-K, that's Beit Dalid uh, Kuf. Um, and that is related to a bunch of things. So like, um, it was the bedecking, right, in, in, at a wedding, when you, when the bride circles, uh, that's, that's checking, right, that's verifying, so lobediuk, that's making sure it's exact, um, all sorts of stuff where you're going to see these things over and over again, and I, I strongly recommend, if you have those connections, use those connections. Um, I, for my mnemonic for visiting, mevaker, is um, that I visit people on on vacation when when me vacer me visit people, um, and then you know same thing like if you're if you're Jewish in America you probably know mishpocha so that's mishpacha here uh, just pronounce it like modern Hebrew um, chaverim uh, and same thing asakim that's going to be more cognitive if you know if you know Arabic there's some some varieties of Arabic like that uh, so that's really all I wanted to cover today. And then they're going to get into uh, more stuff in, uh, in later lessons. Now, what I will say is that this book really takes its time in introducing how to conjugate verbs. There's seven main conjugation patterns, and it takes a while to see them in this book. You start seeing some right away. So the, the third chapter is uh, Fshar Lihipagesh, which is can we meet? But you actually don't really start to understand what's going on with Lihipagesh until um, much later. Um, oh my goodness, I got it wrong. Ariel, thank you. Uh, Bidyuk is B plus, ooh, you know what? I'm going to go to uh, Wiktionary and, and, uh, and, and find this exactly. Um, so my mnemonic was actually etymologically incorrect. Um, now, I will say, uh, as you're learning a language, uh, totally fine if your mnemonics are wrong, but um, don't... Uh, don't say that they're related if they're not like me. <laughs> if you're a linguist, don't don't spread uh, misinformation, unintentional.
false information. So let me find this. Let me. I'm just gonna do this because it's easier. Um, exactly. Is this not? Okay. So I'm going to um, atone for my mistake here. I'm going to make a truva. I'm gonna make a response. Um, Diuk, exactly. Okay, exactly. So is this related to Dafka? Is there any? Bidiuk, let your diuk. Okay, it's noun pattern, so uh this is kitul, so that is actually Dalid um Yud what is it, Dalid Yud Kuf? And let's see. And this is something that I would do normally for I'd recommend for anybody. Um to just uh Okay, Yiddish, of course. Um to just uh, see, like, just track it down in, in Wiktionary, track it down in Morphix, tra track it down in whatever works for you. Um, but really, like, this is going to help make those connections as well. Uh, that's not how I want to do this. Let's try, let's try Duke as well. I'm just going to kind of play around here. Film or sheet, so that's not correct. Um, that's the cock, like, like the kika. Um, oh, so I'm getting some good stuff in the discussion. In Aramaic, the yuk is tafka. That actually sounds interesting. Another thing that is uh, worth noting is that there's loan words in modern Hebrew going all the way back to, like, biblical Hebrew. Loan words from Greek, loan words from Aramaic. Um, you're going to get a lot of things there that's interesting. Um... So Gan said, it's lamentable that modern Hebrew textbooks introduce words that are virtually never used in daily life. This out of to whom did you give it? <laughs> May Ayn is one of them. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, they do, to their credit, say uh, um, that, that's, uh, that you're more likely to hear Me'efo. Um, and let me ask, for those of you who are native speakers, um, if I said May Ayn, would you be like, oh man, this guy's... Like, would it be better for me as a non-native speaker to just come in and say meifo, or would you be like, ah, oh, he doesn't know, he doesn't know the technically correct way of doing things. Like, he should go back to school. Same thing. Like, if I say um, lil bosh for for um, uh, wearing something instead of like you know um, le archive, uh, you know mishkafaim uh, or something. Like, if I'm not constructing my glasses, if I just say I'm anilovesh. Mishka fine. Would that be uh, would that be normal, or would that be like he really? I really should have said Leakiv. I see people will laugh. And which one? <laughs> and done. Purim Sameach L'chaim. Oh, don't say Me'ayin. Okay, Achiel, you got it. Okay, so I won't say Me'ayin. I'll say Me'efo. This is part of why I like live streaming is because I get like immediate corrections, immediate feedback. This is delightful. Uh, so I'll say me'efo. Should I say ani lovesh mishkafaim or should I say ani le'arki, ani, ani um, uh, markiv uh, mishkafaim? I hear little Bosch is more casual. So in a formal situation, I, pr I should probably say le'arkiv, but in an informal, I could get away with little Bosch. What about um, socks? Do I lovesh? Garbaim, or do I, what is it, Gorev Garbaim? I'm waiting. I'm not going to end this live stream until I get an answer to that question. <laughs> okay, Omer says, say meifo. Ani lovesh mishkafaim is weird, but ani some mishkafaim is good. Ooh. So, multiple verbs, but... Okay, so Mark says you're still expecting to wear the specific wearing word. Okay. And Gan says, we're say Sam. And he's Sam Mishkafam. So Sam is like to put, right? To 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 place. But not um not like uh uh the other word for placing something somewhere. Leanyach. And I go rev my garbaim. Okay, this is good to know. <laughs> you might think as a native English speaker, like, okay, you know, if if we can get away with Mayain, then we can get away with uh Lil Bosch, all the things. Um, but I have to shoe my shoes and sock my socks and construct my glasses uh, or put my glasses, place my glasses, lasim. Um, and, uh, and what can I, can I sum my kova? 
for those of you who haven't gotten here in your study of Hebrew, it's sort of inside baseball, but the idea is there's all different words for wearing things. We say wear in English, but in Hebrew they have different words for whether it's a hat, whether it's a ring, whether it's a watch, whether it's a shirt, whether it's your pants, whether it's your socks, whether it's your shoes. Um, the Israeli guy here is definitely helping out. Um, <laughs> this is the best. All right. Uh, amazing. All right, well, um, use the most simple and idiotic choice of words, some. I love it. Uh, do, do you all concur with gun? Just some, everything? Ask them how to say dress up. I've heard that word 10 times a day and still can't recognize it perfectly. Dan wants to know how to say dress up. Um, I can lachbosh kova. Okay, to dress up. Is that like... Um, <laughs> Dan, I think I, I think I need to cool it on the on the Czech plum beverage here because uh, you said you've heard the word ten times a day for dressing up and still can't recognize it perfectly. And I was about to ask you why have you heard the word for dressing up today? And then I remembered it's Purim, um, so I guess I'm well on my way to to not um, differentiating between Mordechai and Heyman. Um Boo. Uh, all right, so uh, yeah, I'm gonna wrap this up, but I do want an answer for uh, for Don here. How do you say dress up? You can type it in Hebrew, you can type it in English, you can give us vowels if you want. Um, I guess Hebrew transliteration, and then I will uh, probably wrap up because there's a hamantash in the other room with my name on it. Get away with some. But use a specific verb is better and does not sound weird. Yeah, okay. Um, Don, I'm not sure if you're going to get an answer. What are you dressing up as as opposed to what are you looking for? Uh, le hit la, la beche? I'm guessing it's la beche and not la beche because that seems like in um, hit pael verbs they're always hard. Uh, Christopher is currently eating the last hamantash in the house. You monster. <laughs> Enjoy it. Um, le hit la beche, lit la beche, lit gander, from Arabic gandur. Okay. So we got some, some answers for you here. Le hit la beche, lit gander. Um, ooh, I see le hit chafesh. Is that like to, to become like, chof no, that's not, that's chofech. You got a few answers here. Dan, it's not le hit la beche, more like... It looks like Mark gave you the answer. So you your spelling is a little weird, but um, it, it looks like it's le hit chafesh. Chafesh? Chafesh. Somebody, somebody type it in transliteration for me. I, I, I'm early on my journey here. Le hit chafesh. Okay, so the... The second, okay, the second one is hard, right? In 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 uh, in hit uh, verbs, okay. Lehit chapes to wear a costume. That's what you mean. Lehit um, chapes, chapes, chapes. All right. I feel like that's the thematic word for today. We are not going to get into like analyzing the conjugations for a little while, but I do have a whole. Thing prepared for analysis of, of different conjugations, the pa'al, the pl, the hifil, the um, hitpa'el, and uh, hitpa'el is a little bit more regular than pa'al and, and some other uh, varieties. So, lihit chapes, I am going to remember this, and it says, I just heard it, but it also means to search for something, chapes. Um, for Purim, we only use lihit chapes. I'm saying this enough times that I'm going to remember it, uh, lihit chapes. Um, and, uh, yeah, okay. Um, Dan, I think the, the roots may be, um, you're, you're making a connection. I understand the connection you're making, but that's, um, uh, a different binyan. Um, so it's worth being aware that that's like the, the root letters may be the same, but the binyan is different. Uh, with that, um, I see. Why do they use the word for searching? Yeah, that's. I, I think I was just answering that. So I, I'm, I'm confident here, and people can correct me, but I'm confident that it is um, different binyanim, different 
um, roots where, and this is actually an important part that I'll hammer home in later live streams. The individual three letters in the root, they mean things insofar as words mean things, but they don't necessarily, like the, the roots on their own, the three roots on their own don't have an existence of their own. They're instantiated in words and they're an abstraction that we sort of draw from the words. When it's a different binyan, sometimes they're all related, like clearly related, and sometimes they can have really dramatically different um, meanings. If you can get a, hand, a hold of um, uh, this book, uh, How the Hebrew Language Grew by Edward Horowitz, it does a really good job of talking about like things that are related and like sometimes distantly related or how they're related by like, you know, a, a history of meaning changes with different structures, um, which I think is a, a really good way of, of thinking about these things. But uh, I think the main thing to recognize is it's different structures and therefore those roots might have a different um, function, different meaning uh, in those different structures. Uh, so, lehit chapes, uh, to, to dress up. And that's the word for the day. That's the, the theme for, for Purim. So, um, that said, uh, I've been on here for like an hour and a half and, uh, I, <laughs> I think it's time, um, time for me to, 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 uh, get moving. Cause it's, it's, uh, you know, it's late in the afternoon. Nap time's almost over. Plaga Mincha's already passed, I think here in, in the East coast. So I am going to, um, I'm going to go, uh, thank you all for your time. I'm going to be doing this most Sundays, um, for the next little while. I'm probably going to be doing Arabic most Mondays for the next little while. It'll be Levantine Arabic, not, uh, Fulsa. I have stories about my study of that for years and how a Palestinian American woman, uh, convinced me to stop studying Fusha and I just dropped Arabic for like 10 years. Um, I'm going back to it now, but, uh, we're going to have some fun. So thank you all. Uh, I'm going to reiterate all the learning tools and everything, and you're going to see a very different textbook with a very, like within the same series, which is kind of interesting. Um, so I had a lot of fun. I hope you all had a lot of fun. And uh, until next time, Vitraot and Chag Purim Sameach. And, um, you know, there's going to be a fun journey together. And hopefully by the holidays, uh, I will be speaking in Hebrew. Um, maybe I'll make a YouTube video about the whole process. So thank you all. Uh, go out and, um, you know, be happy. <laughs> you're, you're commanded to be happy today. So, uh, go out and, and enjoy the rest of your day. And I look forward to seeing you all soon. Vitraut. <laughs>